Good morning and <laughs> welcome to the first of the classes which will be dealing with British visual arts since uh, 1945. I'll just put the timer on. Um, so, so far I've looked at the historical background which produced the different uh, creative products we'll be looking at. And I've looked at the theory side, like what does popular culture mean according to a certain number of uh, uh, influential thinkers. Uh, so now I'm going to go and look at some particular case studies, uh, and I'm going to start with quite a long uh, uh, section on visual art uh, in Britain since 1945, and I'll be uh, um, introducing you to a series of artists, some of whom you will know, but many of whom you will, you will not really know. And the question is to look at high culture and popular culture and audiences and see how that meshes with what the artists are, are trying to do. Uh, because when you talk in general uh, about popular culture and high culture, we have the impression that we know what we're talking about. But when we start looking more precisely, we find that the different kinds of high culture and the different kinds of uh, popular culture are in fact very different one from each other. So uh, as I was mentioning the other day, uh, you need a lot of money to make a film but very little money to make a popular song uh, and that uh, affects who has uh, access to uh, production uh, 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 and so on and similarly uh, as we will be looking at some uh, popular uh, some high culture is very popular and some popular culture uh, attempts to uh, get close to 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 high cu high culture so let me uh, just th this example which i came i, I just came across the other uh, uh, last year uh, yeah, last year uh, in, uh, in London, um, shows that uh, the this distinction, high culture, popular culture, is uh, not always very easy to maintain. So here we have uh, the extraordinary new dance show, Message in a Bottle, with the songs by Sting and the uh, dancing by, I think, the choreography by Kate Prince. So what we have here uh, then uh, is um, extremely popular music by Sting from the Police, a Message in the Bottle being one of his uh, his uh, his biggest hits, um, and uh, this is being presented at, at a contemporary dance show. That is the, the contemporary dance, a sort of modern uh, ballet uh, going be uh, beyond ballet, uh, is being presented to the sounds of Sting's music. Uh, now, I, I think it, it's fairly clear that Sting's music is very clearly in the center of popular culture and contemporary dance shows. Well, contemporary dance shows are definitely uh, to be categorized as high culture. They usually need, they, they taught in elite institutions, usually need public money uh, and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and so uh, we're here, here, here we have a, another crossover. There are a lot of them, even though it's a minority um, uh, occupation. So just going to revise the classic uh, descriptions of popular culture and high culture that we tried and, uh, and, and then we'll be able to see how easily they fit uh, with um, the uh, visual art we're going to look at. So popular culture typically is not organized by elite institutions. Typically popular culture is accessible without specialist knowledge. Typically you're not talking about a long and disciplined training. Typically popular culture is mainly enjoyed by working class uh, people, although uh, I was I was uh, uh, explaining that that may no longer be the case, that elites no longer reject uh, uh, popular culture in total. Popular culture often aims at emotional ab uh, uh, abandon and often involves uh, input by uh, subaltern, subaltern groups. But these characteristics are an opus oversimplification and can evolve over time. And to revise while we're at it, the characteristics of typical high culture, typically organized by elite institutions, the conservatory, the Academy of Fine Arts, the Royal College of Music, and uh, I, I can't actually, oh, that's the, the Peacock Theatre who's presenting that, so uh, legitimate theatre, um, something which is sees more middle class than working class people go through the doors on a normal day. Often the public is uh, expected to have specialist knowledge. Production requires long training. Often privileges a harmonious order and rarely involves input by subaltern groups. And again, it's mainly enjoyed by the elite. I'm pretty sure that this is, this is still the case. However, uh, visual art is probably a little bit more complicated or complex than some of the others because uh, it involves a lot of different disciplines, painting, drawing, sculpture, video installations, street art, photography, ceramics, architecture. 
And it's not absolutely easy to fit these uh, totally into one category or another, popular culture or high culture. Uh, so certainly street arts and photography may be um, um, what we call vernacular practices, that is to say, uh, uh, developed, very, uh, very often developed without reference to elite institutions or long training. Whereas uh, uh, painting or architecture, that's normally not the case, or sculpture, that's normally not the case. They're normally right in the art establishment themselves. Um, this, uh, does, uh, this does not mean, uh, however, uh, if they're uh, painting, uh, drawing and sculpture are often uh, part of uh, high culture, this does not mean that they're not popular. And indeed, if, if you look at the art museums where you find high culture, high art, Leonardo da Vinci and Monet and, uh, and so on and so forth around the world, uh, and you look at the art museums and you look at the number of annual visitors, well, the, here's the top, uh, the top 10 or so, the top six, the Palace Museum in Beijing, Beijing has 14 million visitors a year. The Louvre in Paris comes in there in number in, in, in number two at nine million visitors a year. And the British Museum, six, six and a half million. Metropolitan Museum, 6.2 million. National Gallery in London. So London's very proud to get two people in the list. Yes, uh, two museums in the list. Six million. And the Vatican Museum is also almost six, six million. Now, obviously, these 14 million people, these six million people, they just can't all be part of the elite. The elite is not is not, is not so big. So uh, with visual art in particular, more so than, for example, opera, uh, far more people go to the Louvre than go to classical music concerts, for example. Uh, visual art does seem to have a, a particular position uh, uh, which allows it to be very popular uh, just uh, while still being part of, um, uh, part of uh, high culture. Now I'm going to move on to things which are happening in Britain with visual art and things which have, have been happened since 1945. But first of all, I'm going to give you a very, very brief uh, capsule uh, history of, uh, of modern art, uh, just to re re remind you if you've forgotten, if you know more than this, then I apologize. If you know more than me, then I apologize. Uh, some of the uh, uh, questions which uh, opened up uh, from the end of the 19th century with uh, modern art. So here, here you can see uh, what extremely well-known uh, painting from Monet. Uh, and it seems that what had happened is that with the invention of photography in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the 19th century, it became slowly less interesting for artists to simply stick to painting what you can see and going for uh, uh, some sort of straightforward realism and symbolism uh, as uh, uh, was often the case uh, uh, previously. Uh, and so there was more of a tendency to move away from what you could photograph. Uh, and Monet's uh, uh, impressionist art uh, declared even very, very openly that it, his uh, uh, object was to record the impressions uh, that were received by the eyes and by the people uh, and not worry about what they really were. And so here you can see this boat or the or the red sky. And this is the idea that it's painting impressions, uh, which of course are much more subjective, uh, rather than making sure it, look, it, it, it looks like it should. And remember that today, uh, Monet is one of the most celebrated painters across the world. But when he painted the stuff at the time, this was quite controversial. He would say, oh yeah, well, no, he's obviously not doing what painters, what artists are supposed to do. Um, Picasso, uh, by the uh, beginning of the, uh, the 20th century, was going even further. Uh, and uh, uh, here is his extremely uh, revolutionary uh, painting, not in a political sense, uh, in 1907, Les Demoiselles uh, uh, d'Avignon, which uh, began some of the experimentations which would be cu uh, cu Cubism, uh, and there you can see an influence of African masks. Uh, and something really uh, quite different than uh, expressing symbol and, and, uh, and emotion uh, by uh, uh, distorting and altering uh, what, what people lo look like. And this is 1907. Again, you can imagine that it was very controversial. Uh, and although today it's much more accepted, Picasso, there's still a few people who are oh, modern art, you know. Uh, uh, I don't really like that, as we, as we, as we, shall, we shall see. Uh, now, uh, modern art is sometimes reputed to be difficult, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If you look at this detail uh, from Picasso's Guernica uh, in 1937, a large painting uh, which he painted to commemorate or to denounce uh, the massacre at Guernica where uh, uh, German play planes um, 
uh, authorized by uh, General Franco uh, during the Spanish Civil War, uh, destroyed the 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 uh, bombed the village of, of Guernica. Uh, and what you see here then is the suffering that, that this is just a little part of it. And you can see the the uh, brash electric light and the uh, and the uh, distorted horse uh, suffering. And I think that you know the idea of this uh, transmitting emotion in this way. Um, uh, has become uh, fairly widely accepted. I don't think you get many people uh, these days saying, oh, well, no, yeah, that's not art, that doesn't count. So moving away from anything that could be photographic uh, and moving towards a much more subjective uh, uh, vision um, of, uh, of objects was, was well underway uh, uh, before the um, Second World War. And here's another example, uh, for, even before the 20th century, very well known, the screen by Edvard Munch. If it doesn't look exactly as you remember, that's because he, he painted many different ones. He'd like to come back to the idea. Uh, and here, uh, this is generally recognized as being expressionist. Uh, that is to say that what is what is being painted is not uh, coming from the effects of the light or the, uh, uh, the external uh, uh, objects which were being painted, but uh, is coming from inside the artist. So it, it, we're, we're supposed to read in this the despair that comes from inside uh, the artist. And as you can see, he's uh, not feeling very well on that particular day. Now, other artists decide to go much further away um, from uh, the traditions of uh, representative art. Uh, and so uh, Mondrian, and this is again, this is be, uh, this might be 1920. It's, uh, it's that sort of, uh, that sort of um, that sort of date, uh, you get the mo moves into abstract art, and I'm going very very rapidly through this and just giving you one or two examples. Uh, and here, so here you have Mondrian, a Dutch artist, uh, and uh, uh, always uh, painting in primary colors and only using right angles. Again, of course, this was uh, controversial at the, uh, uh, at the time, and one of the ways of looking at this is to uh, imagine that Mondrian is painting a little section of a universe which goes on in straight lines uh, infinitely in every direction. And that each one of Mondrian's paintings is a, a cut out from this imaginary universe going on forever in every, every direction. So uh, trying to give then um, impressions of harmony, of balance, uh, trying to communicate something, trying to make the audience feel something, and, but certainly not trying to represent anything which you have already seen. Uh, so uh, the uh, the whole um, project um, of art then to provoke uh, emotion and to provo provoke thought in the audience, if we put this in a very wide um, uh, sense. If we take another example of abstract art, this is somewhat later on, American artist Jack Jackson Pollock. And uh, you can see what he did here, that he, uh, uh, he refuses, uh, he, he prefers not to use uh, brushes, but to throw the paint uh, uh, and to drip the paint uh, onto, the, onto, the, onto the canvas, of course, le leading to a critic to say, well, I could do that, um, which opens up a whole, a whole load of questions about uh, what art should be. Uh, is, it, uh, uh, is, it, is it supposed to be difficult to do? Or is it mostly supposed to make you think or make you feel uh, uh, different things? Now, uh, Pollock's idea on this is that uh, is that the uh, the uh, canvas was a record of a gesture, the, the throwing of the paint, um, and uh, famously he said, uh, even to throw a stick, if you are aware of the full implications of your gesture, is art. So this is the idea that. Um, it's a declaration of ex existence, if you like, uh, and that, that's, that's what uh, Pollock wanted to do with art. And so here we get the idea that there are many, many different things you can do with art. And I think it's always a mistake to say uh, art should do this, art should do this, because uh, uh, you, of course you're perfectly entitled not to like art which does this and to prefer art which does, does that. But there is quite a wide uh, uh, gamut of things which can, which, which can be done. Uh, just to show you one other, which perhaps is uh, is about uh, making people think. This is a, a work by Christo and Jean Claude. I don't know if you re uh, you know of this or if you recognise it. This is the Reichstag, uh, that is to say, the German parliaments, uh, and the Reichstag was at the centre of twentieth century uh, uh, European history. Uh, first of all, 
or, or even longer, the 19th and 20th century. First of all, it was the Reichstag. It was the parliament uh, of the German Empire. Uh, then uh, it was when when Germany when Germany was divided, uh, Berlin was in East Germany. It was a West, well, this is in West Berlin. West Berlin was an, an enclave inside East Germany, uh, and so uh, the Parliament was moved to another city. The the West German Parliament was moved to an, uh, uh, another city. And when the when Germany was reunited, the Reichstag was again taken up as the German Parliament, so representing reunited Germany. So you've got this enormous historic building. And what does Christo want to do? He wants to wrap it up, and he did. He wrapped it up. Uh, so what is this? Obviously, it's quite expensive to do. It's a it's a massive project, and indeed, I think it took him twenty years to persuade the German Parliament that they wanted to be have their building wrapped up uh, and indeed for him the whole project is the work of art including all the discussions uh, and the uh, in the in the parliament uh, about the project uh, but also on a, on a more basic level i think the whole idea of wrapping up well what do you usually wrap up things which are portable which are given as presents and which bring joy and here you have something which is uh, the, on the other end of the, of the scale, if you like, of triviality, something historically important, historically central, which is being treated as something you can wrap up and give away. Uh, and so uh, that's what I get out of it. Now, of course, the whole thing about uh, uh, works of art is that you're not obliged to get the same thing out of it as somebody else does. Uh, but this uh, uh, extremely uh, impressive uh, real wrapping up of a real uh, 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 building uh, gradually got its uh, stripes within the uh, modern art world. And I don't know if you know, but next year, the Arc de Triomphe in Paris is going to be wrapped uh, by Christo's team, even though Christo uh, died a few months ago or a couple of years ago. Um, final example then, before I get back to Britain, uh, very well known, and I'm sure that many of you have, uh, have owned uh, uh, reproductions, uh, ben, uh, whose idea was to write in rather uh, very specific uh, handwriting uh, general reflections uh, on art, art and philosophy, something perhaps much more, much more difficult for me in any case to, to interpret, uh, but uh, uh, something which uh, uh, has become also another thing you can do with art. So uh, the, the, uh, an artist deciding to uh, set up can either do in a different way something that's already been done, but they may decide to do something completely new uh, uh, with, with, with art. So let's move over to Britain. And, uh, uh, and if I'm looking at visual art since 1945, then we're fundamentally in the, well, obviously in the area of modern and contemporary art. I, I believe it's called contemporary art after 1945 in any case. Uh, and so the first place I want to look is the Tate Gallery. The Tate Gallery uh, is the collection of uh, uh, art museums, uh, which uh, uh, hold the modern art um, for, for, for British museums. Now, the Tate Gallery is actually a network of four art museums. There is Tate Britain in London, uh, which is not a modern art museum, which, but which takes British art all the way back many centuries. Uh, the, uh, the Tate Britain, which was previously the Tate Gallery, was founded in 1897, so a long tradition there. Uh, Tate Liverpool, which was founded in 1988, uh, uh, as part of the idea that um, high art and museums should be spread around the country and not all concentrated in London to give more people a chance to, uh, to, to have a go at it. Uh, Tate St. Ives, which was, I think I've got pictures of each of these here. So there you've got the Tate, Tate Gallery founded in 1897. Um, and there are two interesting things about this. First of all, uh, is that it's not free for all. Uh, museums, national museums in Britain are free, which is a very interesting thing in itself, because obviously uh, that symbolizes a feeling by government and by the people that art museums are a public service. Uh, and they've always been free. I, I know that uh, the Conservative government did introduce charges at one point, but they were very unpopular and they quickly and they were quickly taken away. This is, of course, an advantage for uh, tourists, because if you go to London, most of the museums are free, which means, of course, you can just go in for an hour. Whereas if you've paid £15 for each museum, you feel you can only go if you've really got time uh, to, to, to spend there. So for, uh, for free admission is interesting because it means it's part of public policy. 
Here we have Tate Modern, Modern then founded uh, in uh, 2000. This is one I haven't mentioned yet. Tate Modern founded in 2000, then a specific place for only uh, uh, modern art, uh, international and British. Uh, and you will notice that it has been founded in an industrial building. It wasn't built like that. It's been founded in a disused industrial building. So a very interesting idea there. You have similar things in Paris. The Musée d'Orsay was of course a railway station before. Uh, and was threatened with being demolished until they decided something new to do with it. So the Tate Modern in, inside this industrial in, in, industrial building, uh, Tate Liverpool then founded in 1988, I just mentioned, and Tate St. Tives, uh, St. Tives is a town uh, in Cornwall, I'm pretty sure, uh, yes, uh, and um, uh, and uh, it was uh, founded in St. Ives because there was a school of painters at St. Ives. Uh, just like in the south of France, there was a group of painters who liked to go there to paint because they said that the light was particularly uh, appropriate. Uh, so uh, Tate, St. Tate St. Ives was founded because of the local school. Uh, and these days, of course, uh, you have the uh, uh, Tate, uh, Tate, Tate, Tate Online. See if there's any, um, anything I'm missing of what, 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 I've, what, what I've said there. Yeah, Tate, Tate Online, which of course is important these days, uh, not just because of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the sanitary situation, uh, but uh, people expect to be able to do different things. And you can see that you have things like Tate Kids and schools and uh, teachers, uh, uh, that one of the ways in which uh, museums act as public services is by uh, inviting school groups in. So that, that's the, 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 Tate, the Tate Gallery, tremendously popular. Uh, and also an interesting thing about the museums is that it seems that every time you open a museum, more people want to go to museums. You actually create an audience, especially if they're free. Uh, and so this is something which is uh, interesting. We cannot, uh, the Tate Modern in, in its first uh, year got over 5 million visitors. So there's no way that you can consider um, uh, modern art to be a tiny minority interest. I now want to look at one particular project, uh, and this is the fourth plinth, uh, and this is a particular project of contemporary art, which shows some of the, um, uh, what's the word, some of the issues at stake uh, in contemporary art. Now, what is a plinth? A plinth is a, uh, a base uh, on, which you, on which you place, for example, a statue. And this is the fourth plinth, which means there are three others. And where are these? Well, they're in Trafalgar Square. They're in Trafalgar Square. In Trafalgar Square, there were four plinths. Uh, in the center, there is Nelson's, uh, uh, Nelson's column, uh, guarded by four lion statues at its base. Uh, and uh, three, uh, there, there are plinths at each of the four corners of the square. Uh, the two southern plinths carry sculptures of Henry Havelock and Charles James Napier, who are... Um, uh, uh, want to make sure I get this right. Uh, these are well-known philosophers and uh, um, mathematicians, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and the northern plinths, there are two plinths which are uh, a, a little larger, and they were designed to have equestrian statues. That is, statues of people, of men on horseback. And indeed, the third plinth, uh, uh, the northeastern one, has a statue of George the Fourth, King George the Fourth, on horseback. So uh, a very much a traditional statue, the, the, the uh, um, King on horseback is a long, long tradition um, of, uh, of statue making. And the fourth plinth, which was built uh, in 1841, was intended to hold an equestrian statue of William IV, so another king. But they ran out of money and the plinth remained empty for well over a hundred years until the Royal Society of Arts in 1998, they conceived the fourth plinth, plinth project. Uh, what they said is, well, let's use this fourth plinth, plinth to have contemporary art, today's art. Millions of people will see it. This is the center of tourist London. Millions of people will see it, but let's use it to, to look at today's art. Now, the first thing we have to think about this is actually position. That is, it is in an extremely prestigious position, the centre of Trafalgar Square, named after the battle that was won by Britain, Nelson in the middle, uh, William, uh, the, the uh, sorry, George, the imperial king hero at one end, and then 
the fourth plinth. Uh, so it, 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 it's bound to be in some way an intrusion into a very traditional patriotic space. Uh, and where a contemporary art is put uh, is extremely important. It's part of the meaning of the work. So, and what they decided they were going to do is that they were going to have temporary um, occupation of the fourth plinth. That is, they, were, they weren't going to set up something there to, to leave it there for 10 years. No, uh, they were going to every year or every six months change it. And here are a number of the works that they decided to use. This is one by uh, Bill Woodrow called uh, Regardless of History. And you can see that it's a, uh, perhaps you can't see, it's a pile of books with, gr with uh, trees growing out of them. Uh, and this one uh, is uh, Elm, Elm, Elm Green, Elm, sorry, Elm Green and Drag Set. Um, and I will be showing you some more in a moment. Now, every one of each one of the uh, sculptures uh, or installations caused a certain amount of debates, uh, and there are also people who permanently say, "Oh, now really, we need a permanent statue." But whose statue should we have? Uh, somebody said, let's have a statue of Nelson Mandela, because this is just very near the South African embassy. And this would be interesting in the sense that you have these great imperial heroes and then an anti-imperialist like Nelson Mandela in the, in the corner. That would be interesting. Uh, but for the moment, there has not been a decision. Uh, uh, other people wanted another traditional imperial hero. But for the moment, the fourth plinth project has continued. And here you have Elm Green and Dragset's rocking horse. Uh, now, the meaning of this is, uh, is it's fascinating. It, it's obviously a little bit of a joke. We have uh, Nelson on top of his column and George IV on horseback over there. And here we have a little boy on a rocking horse. So it's a little bit mocking of the imperial grandeur, grandeur around. Uh, and at the same time, well, this is what uh, the artist said about it. Uh, so artist duo uh, Elm Green and Dragset have become the latest contemporary artist to unveil a public sculpture on Trafalgar Square's fourth plinth. The artists are famous for opening a Prada boutique in the middle of the Texan deserts. Okay. You can see the joke there. They, they, so they used to humorous work. They opened a Prada boutique in the middle of the desert. Of course, the, uh, the reflection being, you know, what use really uh, when there's nothing around, what use is a luxury boutique? Uh, and this one is called uh, Powerless Structures, this, uh, this, uh, this statue of a rocking horse. The 4.1 meter high statue is a twist on a traditional equestrian portrait, the artists say, because instead of celebrating military victory, and commemorating fame, it acknowledges the heroism of growing up. The artists say that when you're a child, getting to be an adult is really a heroic thing to do, and this uh, they, they, they deserve to be celebrated for this. So uh, the artist is fulfilling uh, uh, his, their, their artists are fulfilling their job here, uh, uh, at least according to some people, because it it's supposed to uh, make you think. Yeah, that uh, uh, that a a, a um, uh, a contemporary artist, many people think, is supposed to make you think rather than necessarily make you, uh, rather than necessarily make you feel, oh, that's beautiful. That's not necessarily part of the deal these days. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, we have another one. Uh, and now you notice that these are international artists. So this one is by uh, Yinka Shonibare, who I assume is, 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 uh, uh, is um, is Japanese and this is called Nelson. Uh, no, uh, not at all. He isn't. He's an Anglo-Nigerian artist, so he's from Britain and Nigeria. Uh, and this consi cons consists of a replica of Nelson's ship. That's Nelson up on the column, the HMS Victory. Uh, but the uh, the uh, sails are made of printed fabric in a colourful African pattern, and it's inside a large glass bottle stocked with a cork. So again, he's obviously chosen Nelson's ship because they're in Trafalgar Square with Nelson, uh, and Nelson, who saved the British Empire from the French, uh, is uh, here, has his ship kept in a bottle as a souvenir with African sails, and so there's a, obviously some sort of um, fight back against the empire, because of course Africa was uh, uh, very much a victim uh, of um, uh, of the uh, of the Brit the British Empire. 
Now, this, uh, uh, this piece uh, was up for a while, and this was a much more traditional piece. Uh, this is a traditional uh, uh, hero statue. Air Chief Marshal Sir Keith Narodley Park, GCB, KBE, MC and Bar, DFC, who died in 1975. He was a New Zealand soldier, a First World War flying ace and a Second World War Royal Air Force commander. And you can see uh, this has been put forward by people who are not really interested in this contemporary art, criticizing the empire, but go, want to go back to uh, something more, more modern because he only died recently uh, and, and in the style more modern, but uh, traditional in its meaning here, more of our heroes. This is Trafalgar Square. This is where we have our heroes. Let's have another hero here. Uh, now, different people, of course, had different opinions about it, but um, one of the uh, more left-wing uh, newspapers came up with this. Maybe it's unfair to interpret something so hackneyed and drab as art. At least this lamentable sculpture puts the idiocy of the know-nothing artistic conservatives into full public view. You may think much of contemporary art is shallow. You may wish for something deeper more emotional, more imaginative, but aesthetic regression is not the answer. The simplistic call for figurative art is just lazy minded. Modern art was called into being by modern life. And as we hurtle into the future, there is no sign of its pertinence diminishing. So that's the first thing. So it's very, very, very critical of this traditional sculpture because then, you know, modern art is not accidental. Modern art came because life changed. Uh, I'm just trying to forget that and go back to the old ways, just lazy minded. And, and the, I, I mean, I quite agree with him to be frank, but this is just one opinion. There are other opinions. He also goes on to say that the debate, unfortunately, is very simplistic. Britain's artistic conversation remain, remains depressingly slight, depressingly slight, endlessly fixated on a false confrontation of ancients and moderns, proper art and conceptual art. No meaningful art of our time fits easily into those polarities. Nothing is served by reaffirming them. This statue is a monument to saloon bar fools. Okay, so we, we get that he didn't like it. Just one more, perhaps. No, I think I have two. No, I have two or three more. Uh, this was an interesting piece that uh, uh, that was on, on the fourth plan. So it was a very simple idea, but it was used because it was possible uh, because um, of the internet and so on. Uh, and simply, what they what he did. This is Anthony Gormley, uh, and he did this in two thousand and nine. Over the course of a hundred consecutive days a total of 2,400 selected members of the public each spent one hour on the plinth and they were allowed to do anything they wanted. And so what you had is 2,400 people for one hour each being on the first plinth and being autistic or not autistic or whatever they wanted. Uh, and they were chosen um, by, uh, after applying to a, uh, through a website. This was called one and other. And you can see that this, this gentleman uh, thought it was amusing to stand up there for an hour with this message, but is it art? Yeah, and there were many, many others. So this is an interesting idea of idea of participatory art, get 2,400 people in to do it. Um, and obviously this is, uh, this is uh, a uh, uh, idea that they say that, what does he say about himself? You have to be careful with what artists say. They don't have the final word on their own work, but Gormley said, in the context of Trafalgar Square, with its military valedictory and male historical statues, this elevation of everyday life to the position formerly occupied by monumental arts allows us to reflect on the diversity, vulnerability and particularity of the individual in contemporary society. It's about people coming together to do something extraordinary and unpredictable. It could be tragic, but it could also be funny. More recently, very recently, we've had um, a, a, a couple of interesting pieces. This one was from 2019 uh, and it's called The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist. And if you recognize vaguely the sculpture, there's a good reason for this. Um, this is a Yamasu, a winged bull and protective deity, which stood in Nineveh from 700 BC until 2015. 
uh, and it was destroyed by ISIS uh, in uh, 2015, uh, this extremist uh, military uh, army uh, uh, in, in um, that part of the world, uh, uh, be destroyed because uh, uh, for religious reasons. Uh, and so uh, Rakovitz, that's the name, the name of the artist, uh, uh, recreated it in the middle of Trafalgar Square, obviously with a message about the, the value of very, very old art. Uh, but also uh, he made it out of uh, empty Iraqi date syrup cans uh, because the date industry, the fruit, the date, the date industry was extremely important to Iraq very important to its economy. And of course the wars destroyed that. So here you have a memento of a piece of art destroyed by uh, extremists and a memento of a powerful industry which helped people to live and has been destroyed by war. So again, the idea is not to get from it a single interpretation, the meaning of the art. We can't do that, uh, but uh, it's uh, something to uh, make you think. And I have just one very last uh, example. This is the one that's up there at the moment, uh, Heather Phillipson, uh, who uh, produced this thing. And in fact, it, it is a, a giant, it's giant, and it's a dollop of whipped cream with a cherry, a fly, and a drone. And the drone films people uh, 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 passing by uh, and uh, uh, di displays them uh, on, the, on, a, on, a, on a screen uh, ne next door. So it's all, all about decay. It's called the end, yeah? And it's supposed to be a denunciation of uh, arrogance um, and, and, and such like things. Um, uh, and uh, obviously very modern, first of all, very everyday whipped cream and cherries and flies, but also very modernist with the drone, which is filming you. And uh, I'm not sure if it, it just goes out to the screen or if it goes out to a website, uh, which is there to do that. The, and this is Heather Phillipson, a British um, artist um, there. So, so that was just to present then this, uh, um, this, um, piece uh, which is the uh, um, the fourth plinth so we have here an, ex an explanation uh, in uh, in French it said fameuse oeuvre symbolisera une série géante siégeant sur une montagne de crème fouettée une mouche et un drone voilà ok ce n'est pas une simple sculpture mais une oeuvre multimédia le drone filmera en direct les alentours et ses captures seront diffusées en direct sur un site internet ok so is this well it's it everybody can choose you know is this a ridiculous thing to have in a public space or is this something which allows people walking past whether they're tourists or thing to have a little think about decay and modernity and uh, uh, the surveillance society and so on uh, is it doing what art is supposed to do or not uh, now what's important as you will have guessed by now is to open up these questions what your actual conclusion is uh, doesn't matter very, doesn't matter very much that's as far as i want to go today i'll be continuing in the next chapter uh, with uh, with what will it be with the next chapter with specific examples of British, uh, the most important British painters and sculptors uh, uh, since uh, 1945.